thank you very much for the invitation. Um, this is the first time I'm doing uh, this presentation in this particular media. I'm hoping it'll all go well. Uh, I'm also used to normally walking around the stage, being animated, using my hands and my whole body to do the presentation. But now you probably can just see my face. Uh, and I, that too, I'm not sure how clearly, uh, but I'm hoping uh, I'll be able to convey what I want to convey. What I did in order to educate myself to make sure that um, this works well and does not work well is also uh, have some of my former students and colleagues uh, uh, join, uh, register for this presentation. I hope they've joined and they've registered and they can hear me. So what I'm going to do is to, uh, what I thought I would do today is to take you through with some examples of my own labs research and other labs research through the journey of where uh, I started structural biology, what was the state of the art, uh, to where structural biology is today and where it's going. And uh, just to give you a teaser, since most of you uh, are locked at home and we're doing this uh, because of COVID-19, at the end of the talk, I will uh, say a few things about structural biology, COVID-19 and what is going on as well. Uh, and that's just a teaser because that's not my work, it's other people's work. Before I start the talk, because if I go over longer and if I stop my talk early, I don't want to forget to acknowledge all the people who did the work. So uh, this is my extended lab, my own lab, and the lab of uh, Vinod, whom I'm highlighting here. Uh, uh, he shared a lab in Bangalore, and most of the people here are my students, postdocs, their spouses, girlfriends, children, uh, uh, and this is, we normally do this multiple types in my home, uh, we celebrate. So the work I'm going to talk about today was primarily done by a few people. Uh, uh, Sanchari Banerjee, who's here, she's currently in uh, uh, Denmark. I, she said she will be on the line, so if we have very serious questions, she'll be able to answer. Uh, Chetan Arya, uh, uh, who's uh, uh, currently in Bangalore and hopefully move for a postdoc to the U.S., and of course, I couldn't have done this with Vinod and many others contributed, but these were the main actors uh, uh, in what I'm going to talk today. So I first want to acknowledge them, and then I also want to acknowledge funding from the National Institute of Health, the Swedish Research Foundation, the Department of Biotechnology, Government of India, the Department of Science and Technology, Government of India, uh, the institution, and many others. So uh, as I said, I want to thank uh, all of these people. Once again, this is Chetan, uh, this is Sanjuri, and this is Vinod, who did the work. So I'm going to sometimes time, uh, sound like a scratch tape recorder, and some of you know what a scratch tape recorder is. It keeps repeating the same thing over and over again. And I'm going to sometimes repeat this over and over again because I'm guessing there are a large number of young people there, and uh, uh, sometimes it's never bad to hear things over and over again. The thing I want to talk to you about is uh, the idea of what is going on now. If you listen, to, if you think about the narrative about COVID-19, that, oh, the world is going to end, it's such a terrible place, uh, we're all going to suffer. If, you know, this idea that the world is going to suffer and the world is going to end has been going on over and over again for many, many, many years. And one of the earliest recorded stuff was this guy called Malthus. Malthus is a very famous economist. And he said that, uh, the world's food population, uh, the population will stop around 1 billion because uh, we cannot be, we won't be able to produce more food than for a billion people. He looked up, took the total amount of uh, agri cultivatable land and he said all of this and said, after 1 billion, we won't have enough food for people to eat. World population will stabilize at about 1 billion. That's not true, right? We all know that today we have over 6 billion people and uh, we, have, we produce more food than all of the 6 billion people can eat. What happened was science. It's the ability to be for humans to be curious, uh, do research, find new things and new ways. Uh, for example, what happened around the early 19th century was the discovery of the Haber-Bush process Suddenly, we could make fertilizers. We could the rate limiting step in agriculture was converting ammonia in the air uh, and putting it in the soil so that plants can grow. So we are all now about 60% petroleum because we use Haber-Bush process and we make ammonia, give it to the plants, and the plants grow. And there is now so much food. 
that even of 6.1 billion people, we are making uh, enough food for everybody to eat. So the doomsday theory that people predict is constantly being wrong. And I'm sure this COVID-19 doomsday theory is also wrong. We will only be stronger and better if we focus on the correct things. And what are the correct things? The correct things are science. Okay, science and research are the correct things to do. And if you look at any possible way, if you look uh, uh, compared to uh, what your generation is going through, what my generation and my previous, my grandfather's generation or great grandfather's generation, in every measurable way we can think about, the world is a better place. We all live longer, we live better, in spite of the terrible pollution in Delhi, on an average, people breathe, breathe better air, people drink better water. In any way we think of water, food, energy, healthcare, education, freedom, the world today is a better place than what it was before. And I'm gonna make some predictions. I'm gonna say, uh, I, you know, normally this is where being able to see the audience is good, but I'm gonna assume that the majority of my audience here are below 25 years of age. And if the majority of you are 25 years of age or below, Believe me, you're all going to live 100 to 150 years, uh, and, and that's amazing, and you're going to live better uh, than most of us lived. So, and there are many interesting stories about this, but a, a very interesting book has been written uh, by Peter Diamandis, where he says that human ingenuity that has led to scientific progress is the primary reason where we are. Our amazing ability to do good science, be curious, find out why things are happening. And when you find out why things are happening, then our ability to go and intervene and change the way we do things, constantly generate hypotheses that are, verify the hypothesis, modify the hypothesis, and then use our knowledge to create new things. It's the most interesting thing. The challenge that we have today is that we have forgotten that science is about curiosity, asking questions, rather than trying to always find solutions. Solutions will come. We generate knowledge, then we can use the knowledge. And knowledge generation comes from curiosity. And if you don't, are not curious, knowledge generation will fail. So what I'm gonna do is to first tell you a story about curiosity as an introduction to structural biology. And I think Sanjay, who did more, is online as well. So, and the reason I'm doing this also because if anybody Googles me, the first thing they find out about is cockroach, right? So there is a collection between me and cockroaches for the last 10, 12 years. So I'm gonna talk about the cockroach. And if you think of a cockroach, almost all of you in India have seen a cockroach. And all of you also have seen this thing, right? And this thing is called the birth sac. And uh, one of the first things that you do is as soon as you see a cockroach like this, is kill it. But if you're curious and you ask what this is, this is a birth sac. And what is the cockroach doing in the birth sac? It's actually laying eggs, right? And then the mother is moving around with it and protecting the eggs from somebody by accidentally killing it. And then at some point of time, the cockroach embryos uh, come out of this. They, uh, they become little nymphs and then they come out. But most cockroaches just protect the embryos in there. But there is one type of cockroach. And these types of cockroaches are called viviparous cockroaches, okay? And what these viviparous cockroaches, like Dupleptra punctata, or in other words, the Pacific beetle cockroach, they do something more interesting. What they would do is not only would they have these birth sac, they would also fill these birth sacs with milk. They make milk and they feed the babies. And when they feed the babies, what happens is the babies drink the milk and out comes the nymphs, which are very, very highly mature compared to the other cockroaches. And here is a picture that most of you don't want to see, which is this cockroach, the Diplopter punctata, uh, delivering babies. And you can see the number of babies that are coming out. Now, if you think about the process by which this cockroach is delivering the babies, I had an undergraduate student in my lab whose name was Nathan Carsons, who then went on to do his PhD and currently works at the National Institute of Health. He, he was taking care of these cockroaches for a lady called Barbara Stay. And while he was doing that, he observed that when the cockroaches were, the mother was making milk and feeding the cockroaches, he observed at some point of time, the cockroach became, the mouth was wide open, the back was closed, and the uh, entire embryo was very, very shiny. So he took out one of these shiny things, 
and then he touched it with a little scalpel, something sharp. And what happens is this breaks open and hundreds and hundreds of shiny things come out. And these shiny things are beautiful crystals. And my lab does protein crystallography, and that's the primary activity we did in the lab for a very, very long time. So Nathan came with these crystals to me, and he asked me, if I take these crystals and put them in an X-ray beam, will I get diffraction? Because this is the technique that people use to solve structures at atomic resolution. I said, don't waste your time because these are probably crystals of urea because urea crystallizes very easily and it's always, uh, and it's a waste product, very common waste product in our stomach. And if since the back of the uh, cockroach is closed, nothing can go out. All of the waste products have come back to the gut and they have crystallized, right? And it goes away when the embryo, when the baby, when the nymphs are born. So we thought this is what is happening. But Nathan wouldn't listen to me. So one of, and then he decided to take these crystals and put them in an X-ray diffractometer. And this is how an X-ray diffractometer looks like, where you generate X-rays, right? And these X-rays come and you focus these X-rays and you put your little crystal here, and then you shoot your uh, X-rays this this, and you get what is called a diffraction pattern. And this is fantastic. Now, one of the first things that uh, we observed when Nate put this crystal was they got beautiful diffraction pattern that looked like that of a protein and not like, like urea. So one of the first lessons that I learned, and I'm telling all of you is, don't listen to your professors, do what you want to do, okay? So that's the, one of the first lessons that you are to learn is to go do experiment, even if everybody else in the world tells you, don't waste your time, that will never work, do it anyway. So now I don't do that anymore. I don't tell my students ever, that's a waste of time, don't do that experiment. Um, because I've learned my lessons from here. Now, what we do in X-ray crystallography is very interesting because this is about crystallography, right? Now you make these crystals and it's very hard to make protein crystals. A lot of the time, uh, people who do crystal structures do is to spend their time trying to get pure protein, express and then crystallize them. And then once you crystallize them, you can put them in a diffractometer, get uh, diffraction data, and then you can use an interesting mathematical technique. The mathematical technique that we use is called Fourier transform. This is not a class, so I'm not going to tell you how Fourier transform works. But all I'm going to tell you is Fourier transform itself is a very, very simple idea. And your ears are doing it as I speak now. It's just that if you have a complex wave that looks like this, you can think of this complex wave as a sum of many, many simple waves. There is one wave here, another wave there, another wave there. And when you add all of these simple waves up, you will get this complex wave, okay? But a wave has two components, amplitude, which is the height of the wave, and the phase is where you are in the particular wave, okay? Now, what Fourier transform can do is a very interesting idea. It can take you from this idea of a wave to a different phase. So you can go back and forth between, when you shoot the crystals, you get electron density, and the information about the electron density of uh, the distribution in your protein or your whatever you have crystallized uh, and the Fourier transform of that can be a bunch of waves with amplitudes. Now, don't worry about this. If you don't understand, this is not important. OK, so how do we do this? What I told you, right, we make these crystals and then we will take these crystals and uh, here are the crystals that are frozen and you will shoot X-rays through this and you will have a machine like this and you will collect diffraction data, which looks like this, from which you will get electron density, which looks like this, from, you will, from which you will make beautiful molecular models. Now, this is very, very powerful because now we can see every atom on how this protein is present in this protein, and then you can say how this protein works. So imagine you wanna make a drug. If you know how this protein is working, can I make molecules that will go bind it and stop it from working? So this is very, very powerful in terms of drug discovery. It's very powerful because you want the biology does all kinds of reactions that we cannot do easily in the lab. So if you want to do a very special reaction and you find an enzyme and you know how it works, you can change it to do the reaction on your substrate instead of the substrate that nature has chosen. So understanding biology at the molecular level is extremely powerful. So this is so powerful that this is a very, very staple technique that this has led to a large number of Nobel Prizes. Okay, whoops, what happened now? Ooh, okay, it has led to a large number of Nobel Prizes. 
uh, from 1901 to 2012. So this technique is so good that understanding molecular structures has been so useful that the number of Nobel Prizes has been so many, including in 2013, right? Now, I joined and I started doing this in around 1987 uh, in Bangalore. And when I started doing crystallography, there were about 10 or 15 protein structures that were determined, total, all over the world, some total. Today, there is a thing called the protein data bank. And if you go to the protein data bank, there are hundreds of thousands of structures. There is a new structure that is determined every about three or four minutes. Okay, that's this development and the technique has been so good. And I'm gonna talk about just one development. One of the developments, one of the development is called uh, synchrotron. What this is, is our ability to produce extremely high intensity X-ray radiation at a number of different wavelengths. So now we got these crystals from the cockroach, right? And we have this beautiful machine that is collecting uh, that can produce very high intensity X-rays. So what we did was we took these crystals and we took them to one of the synchrotrons, put them on the X-ray machine and collected data close uh, to the sulfur edge, and we did some very interesting things. In fact, we spent about uh, eight years to get the structure, and finally, we could get the structure. And the, the structure was amazing and revealing, okay? So what I'm gonna show you now is the result of eight years of work uh, by a large number of people. And this is the structure. The structure is so good, interesting because what you're seeing as these little blue, blue and green and yellow are helices and strands, which are all proteins, and it has all the 20 amino acids. What you're seeing as these little beautiful sugar-like structures are because it's a glycosylated protein, so it has sugars. And what is bound in the middle of the protein is a lipid. Now, this is complete food. You have protein, you have sugar, and you have fat. And what the cockroach mother is doing is making these complete food and making them crystals and filling them in the entire gut of the embryo, okay? And when they fill it, what happens is the crystal has a very interesting property. If you make crystals of sugar, it'll be the crystals will be there as soon as the high concentration of sugar is there. Now, if you remove some sugar, the concentration of the sugar will go out. If you remove a few crystals of sugar, or if you add a little water, the concentration of the sugar will go out. So when the concentration of the sugar goes down, the sum of more of the crystals will dissolve. So this is not only complete food, this is also time release food. So the mother fills the entire embryo with this food as the intestine absorbs the food because there is also liquid there, right? When it's absorbing the food, the concentration of the liquid for protein comes down, some more of the crystals dissolve. So it's, it's also time release food. Then we did some analysis and we found that if you look at how many kilocalories you get per 100 grams, Lilimip is the name of our protein that, uh, that comes from the cockroach, you will see that it has more kilocalories than anything else that we know. So the cockroach milk is extremely, it's crystalline and though it's time released, plus it's also interestingly a very, very high calorie food. So when we published this paper, it was in every possible newspaper. So what are we doing with it now? Great, so we talked about understanding and curiosity. We can do many interesting things. So some of the things that we're doing now are interesting. So what we do, for example, is we have taken the gene. You don't want to eat cockroaches. Some people do. If you don't want to eat cockroaches, we can synthesize this gene, put this gene into yeast. Now yeast will secrete this protein, right? It's high calorie, very good protein. And now if I make bread with this yeast, or if you make a chanapatura with this yeast, you will get high protein chanapatura. So you don't have to worry about eating chanapatura anymore, saying it's high fat because now we're also getting high protein. I'm interested in beer. I like to drink my beer, so and I like to call it a protein drink. So what I do is to, uh, we, have, we are cloning this into Carlsbergensis, and then we can make high protein beer. We can also use the space food. Imagine you're gonna to go to Mars. You're gonna need food for a long time. What better than something that is high calorie, time release, stays for a long time. So there are a lot of applications that we're looking at. So just because Nathan found shiny things in the gut of a cockroach, we are now beginning to find interesting applications. And this is how science progresses. But this is what we do, the structures with crystallography, right? So many Nobel Prizes. But suddenly in the past few years, things dramatically changed. How did it change? 
seeing atoms has become a different way of thinking about it. So nothing in this world is stable. Techniques change. You have to keep up to date uh, and you have to constantly learn new techniques because things change. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do structural biology today. Okay, I talked to you about how we continue to do protein crystallography, but that's kind of history. You still use it, but that's not the most state of the art tool. The state of the art tool today is a technique called cryo electron microscopy. What we do now is we don't have to make crystals. We take single molecules of protein and then we put them in an electron microscope and then we shoot them. And the hope is that all of the molecules will be in different different orientations, right? Some are in this orientation, some are in this orientation, some are in this orientation. And if we can take all of these orientations and assemble them together, we can get a nice three dimensional structure, right? And that's the current state of the art. And why couldn't we do it earlier? Why can we do it today? It's because we have some nice new interesting toys. So this is the latest cryo electron microscope that's present in Bangalore. Uh, it's called the Titan Cryos. It's a 300 kV cryo electron microscope, which means you put your samples and you freeze them and it's held frozen and you put a large amount of energy. The wavelength is about 0.2 angstroms. So you get high, very high resolution. And what you're seeing on the right side are the images taken from this, right? And if you look at the images carefully, that's actually a ribosome and they're hopefully oriented in every different direction. So how do we do something like this? The way we do something like this is to purify a molecule and instead of crystallizing, put it on a grid like this. You can see the entire cryo-electron microscopy grid, which is going into the microscope in a frozen form. And that's about one millimeter. So you can look at the scale. Now what I'm going to do is to take one of these squares and look what is in one of these squares. If you look at these squares, you see now it's one in 100 millimeters. So I'm not going to keep telling that again, but you can see the scale on the right top. You have a little circle. Each circle is a little hole, okay? And it's a little shallow, which means if I drop something into this hole, it will actually stay there. So if I go closer to the hole, you will see that the little hole, and now I can actually begin to, suppose now I put a drop of protein molecule there or a virus there, and the virus will be in this, strapped in this hole. I can then touch it slightly and remove all of the water from above the shallow area. And now the molecules that I want to visualize are trapped in there. I can now quickly plunge freeze them in ethane, and kept it liquid nitrogen temperatures and put it under a microscope, right? And then in a microscope, what can I do? I can go and image only a small area like that little square. Now, when I air, look more carefully at a higher resolution in the square, I can begin to see little round, round things. What are those little round spiky things that you're saying? That are pictures of a virus. I mean, that's an amazing picture that we can see. And you can see the virus is probably in every possible orientation. Now I can zoom further and look closely at the virus particle. Now, if I just take one image like this, it doesn't have much information. I need to look at many, many, many such images and do a lot of interesting technological tricks because as soon as I touch a virus, the virus moves. So what I'm gonna do, even when it's frozen, so I'm gonna take many, many small, small shots at a microseconds and then put them together to make one image. And then what I'll do, I'll take many, many images like this, right, in all possible orientations, thousands of them, tens and thousands of them, and I can do it very, very quickly. And then I put them all into a computer, which is going to reassemble all of these. And then what it'll do, it'll give me the structure of the virus. I mean, this is the structure of the Zika virus that was determined at Purdue. And you can see here, and we're going to go back to some of these pictures again later, right? So this particular picture is interesting because this is a Zika virus. And you see the little red things that are on top? Those are the spikes and the spikes are very interesting. And we're going to talk about COVID-19 at the end, right? Those are the spikes. Those are the ones that go and attach to the cell. If there's a cell membrane, if it finds a receptor, it will go and attach to this. And those are the spikes of Zika virus, okay? Now, this is amazing, right? So we've gone from a place where you could not use electron microscopy to see high resolution and atomic resolution to a stage now, we don't have to crystallize proteins. We can see these molecules and do electro cryo electron microscopy and get atomic resolution structures. And of course, this resulted in Nobel Prizes, right? So, uh, Jacques Dove, Joachim Frank, and Richard Henderson uh, got Nobel Prize uh, in 2017 for cryo EM, right? So now things are changing. Now we got a lot of Nobel Prizes in 1901 to 2013, right? In uh, 1900, 2013 in crystallography. 
I think the trend is going to change. The future is all going to be in cryo-electron microscopy. So let me give you an example. I showed you a generic idea of it works. Let me give an example of a specific project that my lab has done with cryo-electron microscopy. So this is a project that came because of uh, uh, Professor Gurunath. He is a professor in IIT Kanpur in the chemistry department. And of course, Kanpur is a dirty place. It's most one of the most polluted places in the world. So what he does is he goes and collects the slush from uh, there and he looks at bacteria that can degrade different toxic waste products. And one of the toxic waste products is something called dimethylformamide, right? And then and he starts screening and he founds a bacteria of the strain called paracoccus, which can actually break down dimethylformamide. And dimethylformamide is a terrible thing. It's one of the most used solvents in the world. And um, it's well, nephrotoxic. It, the reason it's very used is because it's very stable at high temperature. It's very stable at high salt. It was. It will dissolve polar compounds. It will dissolve non-polar compounds. So it's used in every possible chemical industry. Now, if you have something that's used in every possible chemical industry, and in tons, they are all going into the environment, and they stay in the environment because you can't break them down. And it didn't even exist in nature till uh, about you know 1898 or something like that. And you can't break it down easily. But he found this bacteria that has figured out how to break it. So we asked the question, how does this bacteria break it down? So what uh, uh, Guru's lab had done is isolate the protein. Uh, that's actually converting most difficult amide bond into two different compounds. And this work was all done by Chetan. So what we did is that, hey, we got this fancy new microscope. Let's go and see what we can do with this. So we collect, we went and uh, uh, put these in the microscope and collected data. And what you're seeing is on the right side, bottom is the structure of this enzyme. And it's a enzyme that has multiple new folds. It has an interesting ion active site. Uh, and, and if you look at this carefully, if you look at the electron densities, the electron densities are pretty good that we could actually, just like in crystallography, we could trace the chain of the protein we could see the side change, you know, we could go and say, hey, here is a tryptophan, here is a histidine. Uh, so it, it's very nice that we could go and see all of the chains. Now here is an arginine, but you see, you don't see glutamic acids very well because when electrons hit, glutamic acid tends to go away. So the protein is an alpha beta protein. It's a tetrameric protein of alpha two beta two. Uh, it has two different types of subunits. And the small subunit, which is here, is actually a very interesting new fold. A protein fold is something that uh, we think we have exhausted because we have done all of these hundreds of thousands of structures. We don't find new folds often. We found an interesting fold. This is a very interesting new fold. And the large subunit has three domains, domain one, domain two, and domain three. Domain three has the active site. It has an iron uh, active site bound to two tyrosines and the glutamic acid, which is also very novel. So we're just finishing all this up and uh, Chetan just has a paper that got accepted for publication. So hopefully uh, you will be able to see this work published very soon. So here is the structure of the protein, but what does it mean? How does this protein work, right? That's, a mo that's another question. So the protein works in a very interesting way. If you look at the curve, the protein has multiple subunits and it looks like when we started doing enzyme kinetics, it does enzyme kind of it, it catalyzes the breakdown of dimethylformamide very well at a very fast rate that you can see. Uh, but it also seems to be cooperative. There are these multiple subunits when one is working, the other is not working, and they seem to somehow control how each other will do uh, interesting things like that. It also works best at high temperatures. Right? It seems to work best at around 55 degrees centigrade. It seems not to break down till about 63 degrees centigrade. It seems to work very well high salt right about two molar sodium chloride the enzyme is still active so it's tolerant to high temperatures and it also seems to work 0.5 molar dmf which can literally break down most other living organisms so remember the bacteria were isolated from slush and the slush in, in which the bacteria live is at high temperature it kind of all kinds of nasty chemicals in it and uh, and it is you know nobody knows what the real ionic strength is but the enzyme is evolved in such a way that even at that high temperature, even at that high nasty amounts of other chemicals being present, it can work. And the structure beautifully explains 
from the first principles of physics and chemistry how uh, it works very well, right? So what about the summary of this? The summary is that this was a man-made chemical in 1893. We don't know where it evolved from. This is the new false. We don't know where it came from. And suddenly it came from new false. It's very difficult to break down. But here is an enzyme. We know the structure. And now uh, one of the things that Chetan is doing is now can we purify this enzyme in large quantities, put them in a column, in a large industrial size column, and you flow the slush through and you break down all of the DMF when it comes out. So you remove all the toxic compounds uh, that are coming out from this without the bacteria, right? So now you can do it in very, very large quantities and you can use it over and over again. So here again, randomly collecting some slush, you do some structures and you find some industry applications uh, for the environment. I can go on and on and about this. But so far, remember, when you talked about structure biology, we talked about X-ray crystallography where we did structures from purified proteins. All I've told you with cryo-EM is we have done structures of purified proteins. These are extremely useful. Uh, the fact that it has got so many Nobel Prizes is itself an, uh, evident that what use it is. Almost every pharma company has a structure biology program. Uh, every biotech company uses structure biology. So this is kind of a, <clears throat> that everybody uses, yet it's not an easy. What I've taken you through is how we do structural biology today, right? X-ray crystallography, cryo-EM. The question I've been asking when I put this talk together was, what the future of structural biology? And I'm, I'm saying this because most of my students and postdocs, who are some of whom are here, have already heard me, hear me talk about all of the stuff I've talked before. So everything I'm gonna say now is kind of speculation and most importantly, not necessarily my work, okay? I've assembled this, from different people's work, and I'm projecting a future of where structural biology is going because it's a very, very exciting time for structural biology. Let me go back. I said I'll spend some time about COVID-19 and talk a little bit about COVID-19, right? So the COVID-19 hit us, say, January. You'll be very generous in, say, January. So today we are uh, end of April. Now think about this. If you go to the protein data bank, there are 160 structures of COVID-19 related proteins. There are 100. 100 28 of them were done by X-ray diffraction. 32 of them were done by cryo-electron microscopy. One of them was done by nuclear magnetic resonance, which I don't, which I didn't talk about very much, even though my lab has done some work before in that, because we don't think it's a routine tool anymore to do protein structures. <clears throat> it's a very important tool to look at dynamics, but not for looking at structures. When you look at this, you're going to say, hey, you said cryo-EM is easy. Crystallography is harder, you have to make crystals. But there are 128 from crystallography, 32 by cryo-EM. Difference is that 128 of those structures are of a single protease. If you look at HIV, the biggest target for HIV inhibition is the HIV protease. Similarly, there is an important protease in COVID-19. So what a group did was crystallize COVID-19 and they soaked it with every possible compound which they think could be a possible drug and did the structure of it. So 128 of the 160 are the same structures, right? But it is with complex with one drug, complex with another drug, complex with a third drug. And they're using a synchrotron, they're doing high throughput like what I said, and they're doing this, churn these structures out in the last month, 128 structures with 128 protein drug complexes, which pharma companies or others can use to design better drugs against this protease so that we can stop COVID-19. Now, again, these are all purified proteins, but you know, we want to really understand how this virus infects a cell, specifically a lung epithelial cell. Can we do this? What have people done? And can we understand at the same molecular resolution? I want atomic resolution and I want to understand how it does in the cell. So there's an interesting tech, bunch of techniques that I'm going to talk about that people have done. I mean, this was developed by the Briggs lab. What they do was something very, very interesting. And the references are there at the bottom, right? So what they do here is something very, very interesting. They take this cryo-EM grid that I showed you, right? It has these little wells. They put cells, say, in, in, in say, if it's COVID-19, you would put the lung epithelial cells in there. And then I would put a fluorescent probe on my, attach a fluorescent probe to my virus, and then I will put the virus on top. Now, what will happen is the virus will now go infect the cell. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take that infected virus cell and freeze it. Now, that frozen temperature, what I'm going to do is something very interesting. I'm going to do light microscopy, fluorescence microscopy. 
And when I go to fluorescence microscopy, what I find is, hey, where are possibly the viruses? Don't worry, I'll show you some of these images. I'm just giving you the workflow. And then if I find in a particular place this red color, say, for example, this red bright dot is the virus, I'm going to say, okay, now I can't use the electron microscope to visualize this thick block. So what I'm going to do is to use a technique that material scientists use all the time. It's called focused ion beam milling, where you can use gallium to go and itch things. Now this is frozen, like this is a piece now. What I'm going to do is to use focused ion beam milling and itch it and make it into a small, thin little piece here, right? Now I can take this thin little piece, which is in the grid, and I know where it is because of the fluorescence, and go put on a cryo-electron microscope, and then instead of hoping that there will be many of them in many possible directions, I'm going to start moving the grid plus 70 to minus 70 and collect 140 degrees of images. It's the same thing as if I can get images of this from different orientations. But since I can only get 170, uh, 140 degrees, and I don't get 180 degree images, the resolution will be slightly poorer, but that's okay. So let me give you an example of how this is done. So this was a di um, work done by Lauren Ann on how HIV, for example, infects the cell. What she did was very interesting, right? What she did was she put this in these grids and you look, these grids, you can't say which grid has virus infected. Then since the viruses are a fluorescent marker, she can go and say, hey, you know, this particular grid is fluorescing which means here I have cells which have a large amount of viruses. I can go and look at it closer and see what happens. So she's looking at specific grids and some of the grids, some of times the viruses are inside the wells, sometimes they're outside the wells and she's going to ignore the ones that are outside the wells and then go look at inside the wells. And then when she looks carefully, you can see, you can see because she can see some red fluorescence. And then when we zooms in, she can begin to see interesting virus-like particles there. Now, what does this mean? Can I zoom in further? That's the question, right? Of course you can zoom in further. What does she do? She zooms in further into this and finds some very, very interesting uh, things. She, here are the green uh, fluorescent spot. She zooms in and zooms in. And if you look, I'm going to skip all many things and go to this particular image, which is the bottom right for you, image number eight, where she sees on a cell membrane, she can see virus particles sitting, which is amazing. Then she says, okay, I have some virus particles which are here, which are free, not bound to a cell membrane. I have virus particles which are bound to a cell membrane, right? And I have virus particles that are inside a cell membrane. Now, can I go look at closer at these places and see how the virus could be infecting these cells? Okay, now this work was done by somebody else. And what I'm gonna show you is a work again on HIV. Now you see what they did. They went closer here. They went closer. And now I'm gonna only talk about one part of it, which is how the virus is connecting to the cell, right? If you can stop the virus changing to the cell, then you can stop the infection. So what they did was, oops, I want to go back to the previous slide. What they did was to see, they focused now closer on the cell membrane area and they started looking at these images. Now, if you look at any one of these little things here, you have both the protein, the receptor from the cell. If it's COVID-19, it would be ACE2. And the spike protein, in this case, HIV, it's CD14 and uh, the spike protein. They are coming to uh, uh, interact with each other. And I can see it at reasonable resolution here, right? Now I can use this to make a model. And what will I get? I will have free viruses, right? I have free viruses. I have viruses bound to the membrane. And I will have viruses which are half engulfed into the membrane by vesicle transport. And then I will have empty vesicles with the receptor still stuck in, but the RNA is gone inside. I can look at all of these at very, very high resolution. How, how high can a resolution can I go? Here is an example of what people have published with HIV, for example, right? In the case of HIV, you will have uh, the virus, the G, it binds to GP120, the viral protein, and the cell membrane is CD14. And you can see how they bind to each other. And you can see by electron microscopy, here is the viral membrane. Here is the GP120 and here is CD14 that is bound. So you can actually begin to put together how the virus is actually binding at atomic resolution to uh, the protein. So let's go back to COVID-19 again and ask, can we now know all of this and begin to see how COVID-19 is probably uh, binding to ACE2, right? People have done the structure. What I'm showing you here is the structure that's published of the uh, virus membrane, okay, 
and the virus membrane uh, is the virus and virus membrane. This is the structure of the spike protein, the red spikes that you see, right? And here people said, okay, we know it's the ACE2 receptor. Let me cut out the pep, uh, you know, ACE2 is a peptidase. It makes a, makes a peptide bond. And they made a complex of the virus and the receptor binding domain of the virus is bound, bound to the uh, protease domain of ACE2. So this structure was published. And that's great. This was done by one person. Then you go and look, you can go and look at another structure. This is an interesting structure. This is the structure of ACE2 published by cryo-electron microscopy. Now, if you look at ACE2, here is the peptidase domain. And what they did was they did the structure and complex of the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. This is the receptor binding domain of the spike protein. I asked myself, hey, if I know the structure of ACE2, and if I know how the receptor is binding, and if I know the structure of the uh, spike protein bound to this, what happens if I put these two together, right? So here is the ACE2 bound to the receptor, right? And here is the lung epithelial cell membrane. And on this, if I superpose these two, I will see how the spike protein is binding now to the lung membrane, right? So here is the sars cov Here is the spike protein. And here is the receptor binding domain. It binds to the ACE2. And now, once it binds, it will curve the membrane and the membranes will fuse. You will make a vesicle and then the RNA will go inside and you get infected and it will multiply. So I just use SARS as an example to look at how beautifully now we can now look at structures at atomic resolution using a variety of techniques and then go and understand just not how molecules work, right? That was the first part with X-ray crystallography and single particle cryo -EM. But if you combine with that, light microscopy, fib milling, tomography, and you combine all of this and functional studies, you cannot not just now understand how molecules work by themselves. You can also work how molecule and molecular complexes work inside a cell. Uh, this is an amazing, amazing, amazing thing that is happening and that we have so much stuff going on now. I'm going to thank you, stop you here. But what I want to say is, this is a fantastic time to be in science. And I'm jealous of all you young people because you're going to have so much more fun. When I joined crystallography, it took us years. My, my The person who worked in my lab before me, Sanjeev Munshi, his entire PhD thesis was on collecting X-ray diffraction data. And today it takes less than two minutes to collect X-ray diffraction data and process it. For us, getting the structure of a protein was a hard deal. And today we are doing it routinely. And then we still do on isolated proteins. And today we can do this at atomic resolution in cells and begin to understand from the first principles of physics and chemistry how biology works. And we have come a really, really long way. Why is this interesting? I'm going to give you an anecdote to connect this to engineering and other areas which you always think about. Imagine you go, uh, you want to build a bridge across uh, someplace, say a river. And you go to an engineer and say, I want to build a bridge across a river. The engineer will ask you a bunch of questions, uh, and then he will go and measure the soil, he will measure the width of the river, how much water is going to flow, and then he'll ask you, is it for a river, for a bridge for people to walk, or a river for, uh, or a bridge for cars to go, and he will do all of this and come up with the design to build the bridge. And once he comes up with the design, you go build the bridge, and the bridge works, right? Why? Because now he understands all of the physics and the chemistry and he can make mathematical modeling out of this and he can predict it amazingly well to see exactly how things will work. And he can design from first principles a bridge that will do what you want it to do. Even today, how do we do drug discovery? Completely differently. You throw a bunch of things on the cell and hope something will kill the cell or something will kill the virus, right? And the doctor, you go to the doctor and say, oh, I'm sick. He'll say, let me try this medicine. If it doesn't work, I will, you can try this one. Now, we have come to agree. We some come out seem to say, oh, that's acceptable in biology. Why should it be? And it's, it's not acceptable. Uh, it's acceptable today, but need not be acceptable. And the reason we can't build a bridge in biology today is because we don't understand everything of how biology works. But where are we going now? We are going now to the level where we can begin to understand biology at such details of physics and chemistry and make amazing 
mathematical model sort of this that soon in before that in your time personalized medicine that you would be able to actually design things for biology the way physics engineers civil engineers are building bridges or mechanical engineers are building uh, a, a, a toy or electronics engineer is wiring some what you want to do because they have the physics and the chemical understanding of how a chip works and how a wire works. We are the cusp in biology. We are beginning to understand how biology works from the first principles of physics and chemistry. In the next 50 years, there's going to be tremendous fun. And 50 years from then is when we will have these engineers being able to do anything you want to do. So I'm real, I am not sure I'm going to be alive to see uh, uh, the fruition of this, where we can build bridges for in biology the way the engineers do, but I'm going to be your part of the fun of understanding how all of this works so that we can build these bridges. And many of you are going to have the opportunities to be part of it. And I wish you become part of it. It's very easy to make money. It's very easy to be in software. It's very easy to, but it's very hard to be in science. Uh, but the most interesting thing about science is what I have on my screen. The good thing about science is that it's true. You don't, whether or not you believe in it, it's not like God or other things where you have to believe. There is no faith in science. It is true. You don't need to believe in it. Even if you don't believe it is true. You have a great opportunity. I hope most of you make great, make use of this opportunity and do wonderful stuff. Thank you very much. And I'll stop there. And I just have one question. Have you uh, dealt with COVID-19 uh, protein so far? Have you worked on, on this, that virus uh, in your lab or uh, is it or the work is going on? I don't, yeah. my lab, we don't work on COVID-19 so far. We are, yeah. uh, uh, we don't work with the virus, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, at the Purdue University is in a very unique place where in our uh, structural biology facility is one mm -hmm. of the few structural biology facilities where we have a cryo-electron microscope in the BSL-3 facility, which means okay. we can actually do structural work there. Okay. My lab is That's not doing, uh, we don't work with the virus, but mm -hmm. what we are doing is working with uh, some of my industry colleagues, you know, startup colleagues, and we, are, we think that people have not been able to culture the virus because they have been doing it on a type of cells called viral cells in which these viruses mm -hmm. don't go very well. So uh, what these people have done, uh, uh, my colleagues in Bangalore have done, is to take in human-induced pluripotent stem cells and converted them into lung epithelial cells. And what we are doing here in my lab in Purdue is to culture these lung epithelial cells and give it to the people in the BSL-3 where they can infect the lung epithelial cells to understand and ask the kind of questions that I was talking about because the lung epithelial cells express ACE2. Mm -hmm. Uh, and therefore, we we'll the correct cells to study how the virus enters. We are involved, but we directly have, uh, it's a BSL-3 virus, and my lab does not have the uh, permission to work with BSL-3 pathogens. So what do you think, what, what, what kind of drug can work to, which can inhibit the interaction of the AC2 with the virus, viral protein? There are many, many things that's going on. One of them is to uh, stop the ACE2 spike protein interaction. There's also a lot more work going on inhibiting the viral replication itself with the protease because, you know, just like in HIV, this is a single stranded virus. Uh, so it expresses all of the proteins uh, as a single chain and then takes this protein to a different function and that the viral protease that specifically cleaves that. So inhibiting this will stop it from being able to cleave and replicate. Uh, there, are, there are people working on... Um, uh, you know, every almost every aspect on the RNA binding protein, which then binds to the RNA and is involved in uh, integrating it. So I think there are about 20 different targets that people are working on. But for the first time, all targets are just not on the virus, but some of them are also on the host cell. So that's an interesting time. Uh, the first question is from Dr. Uh, Deepshika Pandey Katare. She is heading... Uh, Medical Biotechnology in Amity Institute of Biotechnology. And uh, she has asked that group of scientists from NIB MG Kalyani, West Bengal, recently found that novel coronavirus has mutated into 10 different types and A2A strain is the most prevalent strain in India. Which type of strain is reported in USA? You know, I'm not an epidemiologist. 
so <laughs> I actually won't answer that question with a lot of confidence. Uh, in the US, they are only once they have not been they have not done mass sequencing in order to find this. Uh, however, uh, only information that we have from the US is that the strains don't seem to be so different that whatever intervention people are developing will work on all of the strains. It's not like flu where every season it changes to an extent uh, that you need to develop a new vaccine. We don't think that is at least the case in the US currently. That's current situation. And the question is, how do you select your protein targets in the first place for crystallography or, uh, you know, cryo electron, electron microscopy? Oh, the way we do that is every lab does it differently. So my lab, uh, the questions that we ask are driven by science, not because we have a protein. So if we, uh, we are interested in uh, bacterial CLO biology, so we work on proteins that are in, in, involved in that, in uh, gram-negative bacterial pathogenesis. We're invest, interested, therefore, in sugar transport, so we work on a lot of proteins to do with sugar transport. Uh, and then there are uh, other, in, other group interest in my lab is metal enzymes, so we work on these. Uh, there are labs which work on kinases. There are labs that work on proteases. So uh, people don't do structural biology. In earlier days, structural biology was so hard that you picked any protein that you could crystallize and saw the structure. But today, structural biology is just a tool. So we don't do structural biology uh, in the way we did it 25 years ago. We ask interesting biological questions, and we know in order to answer the biological questions, one of the most important parts of the zigzag puzzle is understanding the molecular structure, and then we go and do the structure. So it's not driven because we have access to a protein. It's driven by an interesting scientific question that we ask. The, another question is uh, by MR. He has written excellent talk, sir. How many amino acids of spike proteins are interacting with ACE2 enzymes? More specifically, is there any preferential amino acid such as histidine or proline can be more reactive towards binding? So, uh, how many amino acids? I don't know. It's a reasonably large buried surface area. Many of the proteins, many of the residues are not hydrophobic. Again, this is, I've done this only for the last two days. So, you're asking me questions about, and I didn't do the structure of either of these. I know there are no prolines involved. But there are all kinds of other uh, um, um, hydrophilic amino acids, there are arginine, there are glutamic acids, uh, there are tyrosines. So it's a large variety, and there is not any single special amino acid that seems to have any special preference in this binding. It's a structure, it's a topology that seems to be the preference and the complementarity rather than a specific amino acid.